It's now my real honor to introduce our guest speaker, Anthony Noto. Wharton graduate, 1999, Wemba 23, Philadelphia. Anthony joined SoFi in 2018 as its CEO. Previously, he served as the COO and CFO of Twitter. Before that, he was executive vice president of the NFL. Before that, he spent many years at Goldman Sachs. Before that, he went to West Point. He's a Renaissance man who not only delivers big time, he also inspires everyone he meets. Please join me in welcoming Anthony. Thank you, Dean Garrett. I'd also like to thank and welcome Deputy Dean Gibbons, Vice Dean Bishop Lane, Vice Dean Carl Ulrich, uh, the Wimba staff, and of course, uh, the class of 2019, and most importantly, your families and supporters, because without them, this day would not be possible. So let's give them a round of applause. It's a privilege and an honor to be here today as your guest speaker as you celebrate such a such great accomplishment in graduating with an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. As a Wharton grad myself, I could not have imagined being given such an honor and privilege when I was sitting at my graduation. Thank you for asking me uh, to give you my remarks today. It is truly a privilege. When I started at Wharton, I had just turned 30 years old. I had been married to my wife, Kristen, who's here with me today for six years. Our, older, our oldest daughter, Marissa, was four years old. I worked for Kraft Foods as a product manager, launching an unnamed cereal at the time, which my study group, Group 10, referred to as the chicken cereal because I wouldn't tell them the real name. By graduation two years later, our second daughter, Gabriella, celebrated her first birthday, and she was at the event causing great problems for my wife. The good news is she turned out perfectly fine as a sophomore at Stanford. We had successfully launched the chicken cereal, which was revealed as post Oreo O cereal, and was about to start a new job at Goldman Sachs as an internet analyst covering e-commerce companies. In the 20 years since, this is, happens to be my 20th year anniversary, I could not have come close to predicting what would happen, both professionally and personally. On the personal side, we were blessed with three more children, Ellie's now 15, and boy-girl twins, Anthony and Avery, who are 13. My oldest daughter, Marissa, graduated from Penn in 2016, and as I mentioned, Gabrielle is a sophomore at Stanford. It's now been 20 years since I graduated from Wharton in 1999. I sat in your seat and wondered, what lie ahead for me, and how, how would my time at Wharton help me write the remaining chapters of my life? In 1999, the US equity markets were approaching the peak of the dot-com boom. Only 5% of the people in the world used the internet. And we were in the midst of a relative global, in, in the midst of relative global peace in the aftermath of the Cold War. And of course, that would all change completely in just two years. In contrast, you graduate from Wharton amongst the uncertain global markets, a complete rewriting of business and societal norms due to pervasive technology, mobile networks, social networks, and of course, the ongoing geopolitical conflicts. While our classes graduate under different circumstances, it is without a doubt that Wharton has prepared you, as it did us, for the wide range of uncertainty in your lives that will unfold. Some of that uncertainty will be exciting as you take on new challenges in your career. That's why you came here, right? But some of that uncertainty will test you and will challenge you in ways you've never thought. But what happens next once you leave Wharton? How do you apply what you've learned out in the world? In my experience, one of the critical success factors has been values and how you translate what you learned at Wharton into a practical application outside of these walls and through the rest of your life. I want to talk to you today about the importance of clear values in your life, personally and professionally, and how they can build the foundation of the culture you set wherever you go from today. The world you will lead will not have the same foundation that you have from Wharton. Most people have not been afforded your same opportunities to learn and grow, to lead and fail. I've been fortunate to be part of institutions with a strong sense of culture. West Point and the Army, Wharton, Goldman Sachs, the NFL, and Twitter. Each had its own distinct approach, but the thing I shared and the thing I found was that the clarity about the practical meanings of that culture were critically important to what I did next. Let me tell you a story. 
I made a big change in my life last year and left my job as Chief Operating Officer of Twitter to become CEO of SoFi. When I joined SoFi, my top priority, priority was establishing the core values of the company that would build the foundation of the best culture in the world. That may sound like hyperbole, but it's true. That's truly our aim. It doesn't take money or capital or unique technology or some great innovation to have the best culture in the world. Not at all. What it does take is unwavering leadership. It takes a standard. It takes getting alignment and holding people accountable. I am confident we'll have the best culture in the world because you're doing just that every day. In order to accomplish this very lofty goal, our long-term goal is to make sure that we live and breathe 11 core values. They set the standard for the behaviors we hold everyone at SoFi accountable for, and they set the standard for how we should behave both personally, but also professionally with our members. Many of our core values are a reflection of everything I've learned as a leader, as a teammate, and as a partner. I won't go through all 11 of them today, but I want to highlight a few of, you, a few of them. Our first core value at SoFi is that we must put our members' interests first. If we take care of our members' interests, it'll best serve our interests. Our members have to trust us to treat them fairly, to give them transparency and good guidance. When we do that, it reinforces that trust and forges a bond that helps us both succeed. The second value I want to highlight is to embrace diversity. Everyone should feel welcomed, included, and able to contribute. Diversity is a differentiator, and we want our team at SoFi to reflect society so that we can better meet everyone's needs, not just our needs. As a leader of a large organization, you will no longer get to select the entire team or organization that you lead, but you certainly can decide who is put in the leadership positions, and you can delegate authority to those people that you choose, and you can decide who to give more opportunities to in areas of development, and most importantly, who you promote. Quite simply, you must build a culture of diversity and you will be a better leader and you will have a better team. The third value I want to highlight is to do the right thing. If you're not sure, do the harder thing. SoFi's business is built on trust and integrity, which requires both adhering to the letter of the law and regulations and doing the right thing for the company and our members. As much as I talk, talk about 11 core values and as much as I believe in them, they all relate to your current career and mine. But as we finish today, I want to focus on the final three com my final comments on three of those core values. Three core values that I've had with me my entire professional career. Three core values that tie back to my time at West Point. The first is this. Build a culture of people that run after problems. Every organization has problems that fall between the cracks, whether it's in a business or cross-functional area or a division. Problems that are not tied to one leader or another. Problems that if you don't get fixed, no one individual is at fault. Problems that ultimately hold the entire organization back. Great leaders see the problems and the lack of accountability and run after those problems to fix them. Not because it's on them to fix, but because it needs to be done for the greater good. Great leaders ask themselves, how can I fix this problem? They don't ask themselves, it's not my problem. They run after problems because it's their duty, because if they don't, the team fails, even though they might succeed. Running after problems is a mindset, it is a culture. Build the mindset in your unit, in your company to run after problems, and you will instill in them a wide world ending teamwork ethic that will last a lifetime. The second value I want to highlight as I end my remarks is to build a culture that is committed to getting to the truth. A team, a company, a unit cannot be excellent if it cannot get to the truth. When I say truth, I'm not talking about the obvious elements of honor in not lying or cheating. But what I am talking about is the gray area between the black and white decisions. What I am talking about is the judgment required to make critical decisions that will lead to success or failure. You cannot make the best decisions without the right information, without the right data, without the right facts, without all of the team's perspectives, without the truth. Sometimes this means testing the choices and making sure that you don't use the data that solves for your favorite outcome, but use all the data to make the best decision. This means keeping an open mind, even after you have 99% of the information, because that last 1% of the information of that thought process, of the process of looking at the truth, may be the most critical piece of information. I cannot tell you how often leaders have made a decision before they have any data, let alone 99% of the data. As a leader, 
You must set the example and drive the organization to always get to the truth. Because if you honor the truth, you will make the best decisions and only then can your team reach excellence. The third core value and the last that I'll highlight is to build a culture of people that make their footprint bigger than their foot. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, Steph Curry are all great examples of athletes that make the other four people on the ice or basketball court better than they otherwise would be. They're all people that make their footprint bigger than their foot. They are special, talented individuals. But you don't have to be the greatest athlete to make your footprint bigger than your foot. What you have to do is play for the name on the front of your jersey, not the back in everything that you do. There is no doubt in my mind that at some point over the next 10 years, you'll come up with a great innovative idea that can drive the performance of your team. It might be a new SOP, a new strategy, new innovation to beat your fiercest competitor. What you must do, what you have to do at that point is to resist the urge to use it to make your team better only and instead compel yourself to share the idea with every unit just like yours so you make every unit better, not just your unit. In doing so, you'll be making your footprint bigger than your foot and be like Steph Curry. So build a culture of people that want to play for the name on the front of their jersey, not the back. I said I was only going to talk about three more core values, but I made a decision as we were writing this to share one more final value that has significant meaning for me and our company. In fact, I would have never have thought of this 11th core value until one of our executives, one of my direct reports in fact, suggested we add one more core value to the list of 10 we just spent weeks agonizing over, debating, and finalizing. When she mentioned her recommendation, some of our members on our team chuckled as if to think she was joking. I instantly felt my mouth widen, my lips start to curl up to my ears, and I began to smile. And I said, no, 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 Join is right. We absolutely need this 11th core value. So our 11th core value is don't forget to smile. Our ambition is contagious. It makes us smile to see people inside and outside of SoFi succeed. I love this core value because every time I see it on a wall or in a computer screen or a t-shirt, I smile. And every time I say it to the people in front of me, they smile too. Don't forget to smile. Humanity, humility, and smiling are also important to being a great leader. Joanne's recommendation taught me to smile more. It taught SoFi to smile more, and in doing so made us all better. Remember what I said earlier about embracing diversity? It will absolutely make you a better leader and your team better. Today, you will start a new phase of your life. There is no way to predict the obstacles, the opportunities, the failures, or the successes that you'll experience. I clearly could not. The only thing that you can control is what you do. So, one, work as hard as you can, because if you do, unless you're outmanned, you will always succeed. Two, do the right thing, and if you have to ask yourself if something is right or wrong, you already know it's wrong. And three, take care of other people. If you do those three things, and instill in your teams, in your organization, your company, number one, a culture that runs after problems. Number two, a culture that gets to the truth, and number three, a culture of people that make their footprint bigger than your foot, then you have built the foundation of a great culture. You have built the foundation to have the best culture in the world. We will have the best culture in the world at SoFi, and I hope you're challenging me for that title. Congratulations to the class of 2019, and thank you for having me today.